Okrima Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomolikai. Joining me today is Professor Peter Friedland, here to unpack his book titled Fight Time with the President, a Doctor Story About Learning to Listen. Talk to us about an unexpected call you received that former President Nelson Mandela was struggling to hear. What happened after that? And can you tell us about your first meeting with Mandela? Well, um, I was aware that President uh, Nelson Mandela, and I used to call him Madiba, uh, was struggling with his ears. It was a well-known fact. He, in fact, publicized it a lot, and everybody knew that he was wearing hearing aids. He had lost his hearing perhaps due to being a bit older, but also because he had forced labor in Robben Island and he had to chip away at limestone. And that was very dangerous to his ears. And one Sunday afternoon, I was just pottering around in the garden and Professor Michael Plitt, who was his physician and a fantastic doctor, very well known in Johannesburg, phoned me at about three o'clock and said, Madiba's just landed on the, in his helicopter with his wife, Grasha Michelle, from Mozambique. And they've landed at the uh, Old Edwardians Club on the field which was very close to the Houghton home, and he's very frustrated because he can't hear. Would I mind going to see him? And I couldn't believe my luck. It was a dream come true that I was being asked to see this great human being and unbelievable saviour of South Africa. And um, I got dressed in, in smarter clothes and I raced up to the house. I lived about five kilometres away. And that was my first opportunity to meet the great human and the great man face to face. I had met him 10 years before that, but I was standing behind him and he didn't know that I was there. So this was really the first opportunity. And as a person that looked after Mandela's hearing for close to a decade, and also your memo talks about how Mandela changed your life. So what impact did Mandela have on you? And what moments with him do you most remember? He changed my life for the better. And he had an enormous, enormous impact on me. And when I say that, he had an enormous impact on everybody in South Africa, everybody who met him everybody who even didn't meet him, and in fact, around the world. And he taught me the art of listening to people. I thought, you know, when you're a doctor, you, you're arrogant, you're going to help the patient, I was going to help him with his hearing, and that would be my job. But I didn't realize that in the process, Madiba was teaching me some of the many qualities and leadership qualities and negotiation qualities and personal attributes that he had he was he was schooling me in that and importantly he was teaching me to listen when i say that i don't say that lightly because we, we you hear me i hear you but sometimes especially as doctors we don't listen to people we don't give them the chance to speak we don't give them the chance to tell their story. And when we do that without interrupting them, we can hear their emotions, we can hear their history, we can hear their traumas, their family, we understand them better. And what Madiba taught me was that not only does that person feel better, but it changes us. That experience changes us. And for doctors, that's very, very important. So for example, I would sit there and tell Madiba, about some tragedy that happened to a friend of mine, and he would not interrupt me. You know, he would sit, he could hold the silence, which is very uncommon for a leader. You know, people butt in and they give advice and they give solutions. No, he would hold the silence and listen. And you knew that he was listening to you. I knew he could hear me because of his hearing aids. We were in a close environment and he was concentrating. And then he would say something, and it was very meaningful. The second thing that he taught me was what he taught everybody else, that every human being, every human being, irrespective of their color, their race, their nation that they're born into, their religion, their belief, 
has the same dignity as every other human being. And we're all born with a spark of humanity. And we need to understand that, respect it, and recognize that. So that sometimes with our egos and our pettiness and our politics and our beliefs in religion or whatever, we disregard people and we criticize them and we do the most cruel, inhumane things to people. But if we could remember that we all start at one level and in fact, we're all human beings and we should respect that humanity of everybody. And that's what he used in negotiation because he said, I'm negotiating with human beings. I'm not negotiating with angels. Of course, I can never forget what people did to my people and the sufferings of people and the sufferings of my people. I'm not going to forget it, but I will forgive that behavior so that we can move on and move forward. And I think that that is something that um, stuck with me. And I wish that our leaders today throughout the world, throughout Africa, throughout Europe, throughout the Middle East, throughout Asia would regard that. Because if we took that lesson from Madiba, then the terrible things that are going on in the world today, I think, would be much less. And what inspired you to pen this book? So, you know, there are many, many, many books. In fact, I think almost 200 books on Madiba, written by himself, written by his son, by his family, written by his close, close friends, written by experts, people who are far more knowledgeable about Madiba than me. And most of them deal with his childhood and his presidential years and his prison years. But there's very little written about Madiba when he went into retirement, so to speak, from the year 2000 onwards. And I had this unique opportunity. It was the greatest gift given to me in my life where I could spend time with Madiba at his office in the quiet of his home where he wasn't inundated with world leaders and appointments every 10 minutes or half an hour. And he was shielded from the public because they were protecting him to preserve him and to give him peace and rest, you know, from all these years of hard work. And so these were unique insights that I was given. And I felt I wanted to write these insights down for the next generations. And people may say, ah, oh, another book on, on Madiba. What does this doctor think he's doing? I agree. I understand. But I think in future, people may look back and say, you know, this was a time of reflection. And can you tell us more about your own journey, where you grew up and how you became an ear, nose and throat surgeon? Yeah. The whole book is framed by my experience as a white person growing up in apartheid South Africa. I had this undeserved privilege. I was privileged. Why was I privileged? Why could I grow up with all the education I wanted and everything I needed? Simply because I was white, not because I deserved it. So I understand that now. I grew up as a young boy. My late father was very, very sick as a young boy. And we were sent to work very early. And it was only later that I understood the politics and what was happening in South Africa as a, as a teenager. I started off with veterinary science and I was exposed to enormous amount of racism in Pretoria North that I never even knew existed. And then I started medicine and I was very happy doing medicine. And I kind of fell into ear, nose and throat surgery. I never thought I would be an ear, nose and throat surgeon. And I was unhappy with this. It never fulfilled me until the time that I came to treat Madiba. And all I really did was help him with his hearing. I removed wax from his ears. But I realized then that if I was created just to facilitate this great man hearing a little bit more so he could help humanity, then I'm satisfied then that is why I'm doing ENT or ear, nose and throat. And um, I was very grateful for that. 
And lastly, Peter, what led to your decision to move to Australia and how did Mandela react to the news? Well, that is the most difficult decision that I've ever made in my life. You know, uh, working as an ENT in Johannesburg, I was working at Mill Park Hospital, first at Baragwanath and Johannesburg Gen. Then I moved to the level one trauma unit at Mill Park Hospital and I was seeing the most shocking trauma at the time of the transition from apartheid. In those early years, there was a third force operating that um, was sponsored by right-wingers and, in fact, by the National Party and in and has been shown by, in fact, even in Carter Freedom Party was involved in trying to disrupt the ANC and the transition to a peaceful democracy and a new constitution. And then, of course, following the new South Africa, there was a lot of hooliganism and crime and random gun shooting. And I was exposed to this and I saw people, black and white policemen, and in fact, family members and friends who were very brutally injured. And I had three very close friends who were killed, one who was a doctor at the hospital, one who was another friend at his premises, and another one who was a friend just at the soccer field watching our kids come off the soccer field. And in those days, you know, you grinned and bared it. No one really spoke about mental health, you know. And I developed post-traumatic stress disorder, even though I went for therapy. And I spoke to a therapist on a weekly basis, but it got to a point where I had too much anxiety. I couldn't cope anymore. And I decided I need a circuit breaker. And I was never, ever going to immigrate. And everybody knew that. I was committed to South Africa. And when I made the decision, no one believed me. Even my wife didn't believe me. Even I didn't believe myself. I was 47. Who leaves the country at 47, 48? And when I went to see Madiba, I was expecting him to be very angry with me and criticize me and tell me that I'm deserting South Africa because... You know, um, Tabi, I was deserting the country. I was leaving the country when the country needed my skills. I can't, I can't uh, whitewash this or airbrush it with rose, rose-colored tinted glasses and saying no. I was going to do research, and Australia needed me. Australia didn't need me. They've got enough doctors. England, America, New Zealand, that I need. That I need us. But I myself wasn't in a good place. And when I went to see Madiba, he, just like the human he was, he didn't criticize me. I've put it in my book and I've put that chapter. And he didn't castigate me and make me feel guilty. He brought up the lesson that he learned 19 years before when he went to Australia. And when he first went in 1990, in November to Australia, he didn't acknowledge the indigenous people, the Aboriginal people in Australia. He spoke at the white parliament and he went to the white dinner with the governor general. And he said, no, he's not getting involved in the politics of the country. Now, these indigenous people, the Aboriginal people, are the oldest indigenous people in the world. They've got a history that goes back 60,000 years. They were dispossessed from their land. They were massacred in their millions by the British and almost wiped out. Now they're only 3% of the population. What happened to them made apartheid and other genocides look, look mild. And here comes the greatest freedom fighter, and he doesn't sit with the Aboriginal people. And they have a ceremony where they welcome you to country because land for them is very important. They call it country. Not the country, country. And he didn't do that. And they never forgave him for that. And he realized his mistake. And when he went back just after the Olympics in 2000, he met with the Aboriginal people. And he had a ceremony and he apologized. And so he said to me, doctor, you want to go anywhere in the world? You can go. But make sure you learn about the Aboriginal people, the indigenous people. Don't use ignorance as an excuse like I used. He started talking about his own mistake, not mine. That's how humble Madiba was. He said, learn about it and work with these people and help them. And if you do that, we are all part of humanity. 
you will make a contribution. And I do work with Aboriginal people. I'm very involved in Aboriginal health and uh, do voluntary clinics. And in fact, the book that I've written in South Africa, the book Quiet Time with the President goes to a High Hopes charity, which is run by Wits University for all children who are born deaf and toddlers. And in Australia, the the royalties of the book go to an Aboriginal Indigenous charity. That was Professor Peter Friedland speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about quite time with the President.